Hello and welcome. You're watching Policy Watch, your weekly roundup of all the big economic policy decisions that have been taken across the country, how that impacts our country, our economy. We'll be talking about that to a special guest, Amit Yusen, senior editor at the senior assistant editor at the Hindu Business Line, joins us to help us understand. This week we are analyzing the trade deficit and also as far as the investment atmosphere in, in, in India is concerned. Finance Minister Arun Jaitley is in the United States pitching for India, pitching for investments in India. How successful is that pitch? We'll be analyzing that as well. But first, let's start off talking about the trade deficit. Now, the week brought in some mixed signals for India's foreign trade. Exports registered a substantial decline of 20% in May. But on the other hand, India's current account deficit shrank to just 1.3% of GDP in 2014-15. Here's a report. Weak demand in global markets that covered both developed and emerging economies Couple lower commodity prices led to a steep fall in India's exports in May for the sixth month in a row. Experts blame the high cost of credit and transaction as the main domestic factors besides weak global demand for pulling down exports. Global factors have definitely played a role and the most worrying point at this point of time is that even the emerging economies are slowing down. In 2008-2009, we have been able to sail through this crisis because emerging economies, they did very well and though the advanced economies uh, were slowing down. In May, India's overseas trade was valued at $22.34 billion, which was $28 billion in May last year. All key exports, petroleum products, gems and jewellery, engineering and chemicals declined in May. However, the week also brought cheer to the government as the latest RBI data showed a steep decline in India's current account deficit during January to March this year. In the fourth quarter, it was $1.3 billion or 0.2% of GDP. Current account deficit for the year was 1.3% of the GDP. Let us not draw satisfaction of compression on the CAD because CAD is reducing with the lesser imports happening also. And when we are talking about the lesser import, some of the lesser import may not be good for Indian economy. If your capital goods import is going down or key raw material which you require for production is going down, that's not a good sign for manufacturing as such. There is another positive development on the forex front. The Reserve Bank was able to add a whopping $61.4 billion to the foreign exchange reserves in 2014-15 compared to $15.5 billion in the previous fiscal, taking the total reserves at $341.6 billion at the end of March. Krishnanand Tripathi's report for Rajya Sabha Television. And Amiti Sen is here with us. She's the senior assistant editor at the Hindu Business Line. Uh, Amiti, talking about the May figures, as far as the trade deficit is concerned, I mean, uh, but, so let's break it down. Let's talk about the exports first, the big worry. Uh, there has been a declining trend as far as exports is concerned, but a 20% drop is a cause for concern, isn't it? Yes, definitely. Well, uh, the export drop was sharper in March. Like mm. it was around, I think, uh, 21.4 or 5%. But uh, exporters had expected, you know, after the foreign trade policy was announced that, you know, things might improve. But, you know, the May figures, uh, figures have belied that hope and 20% uh, fall is really disappointing for them. All right. So why is that happening? Is it something particularly wrong with our uh, economy or is it global queues? What are the factors that are at play over here? Well, mostly it's a global issue. Like uh, exports have been falling uh, for the last six months. Like since December, it has been falling and there's been no relief at all. Mm -hmm. So every time, you know, people have been expecting that things are improving, you know, something or the other happens. You know, uh, when, the, when the U.S. was improving, people were hoping that, you know, the U.S. exports would pick up. But then the latest figures in the U.S. also show that there has been a drop there as well. Right. The EU crisis is continuing. So um, I think it's it's basically a global phenomena that is impacting exports from the country. What about our neighbor China? Because as far as India is concerned, I mean, we're always viewed in comparison with China in terms of emerging economies. The IMF has said that India is the, could be become the fastest emerging economy, beating China as well. But uh, I mean, uh, the, the export slowdown is, of course, ex affecting China as well and uh, therefore affecting all the developing countries, all emerging economies? Uh, that's right. You know, uh, the slowdown in China has had a worse impact on, you know, the global trade because uh, the emerging economies have also started getting hurt because mm. of the slowdown in China. Like uh, when China slows down, it, it exports less, it imports less. And since, you know, China's uh, 
China's imports exports are around 12% of total world trade. It does make a big difference. So, mm. uh, India's uh, not only India's traditional markets, you know, the US and the EU, not only are they shrinking, but recently we have also seen, you know, emerging markets shrink. So that is a cause of major concern for exporters from the country. All right, but why is that shrinkage happening? I mean, uh, across the world, is, is, the, is the world economy in trouble and how uh, well is India prepared in that sense? I mean, we have a lot of stress happening on government initiatives like Make in India, which promote manufacturing ultimately for exports or even for domestic consumption for that matter, but primarily for export. That's the kind of message that has been sent out by the government. So are we prepared uh, for a weak global queues for some time now? Do you expect these queues to continue? Well, everybody is hoping for, you know, a, a change in fortunes as far as the world economy is concerned. But yes, you know, we have to be prepared for uh, a longer, longer, you know, continuation of the slowdown. So uh, when the when the global demand contracts, we have to uh, we have to, you know, accept that other countries would try to get more competitive. They would cut down their prices. So mm. that will have effect on our exporters margins as well and mm. make it that much difficult for them to hold on to the traditional markets. All right. Uh, as far as exporters are concerned, I mean, there is a little bit of cheer because uh, the, the rupee, of course, ha has been uh, in the exporters' favor for now. But uh, in terms of the overall economy, because we're talking about the figures as far as May is concerned, and rupee, the, rup the slide in the rupee has also been a cause for concern, isn't it, for the overall economic health of the country? Uh, see, as far as the exporters are concerned, it's basically a silver lining in their dark clouds mm. because, you know, uh, a devaluation in the, in the value of the rupee means... You know, more value for them. Yeah, dollar. more value for them. Like they get more for the for the dollars that they earn. But yes, for the overall econ overall economy, we know that you know it would also escalate our import bill. So uh, for the for the overall economy, uh, you know the rupee has to be valued at the right at the at the right value. But for exporters, yes, it's a relief at this time of crisis for them. All right. So you talked about exports. You talked about imports. What about the trade deficit now? That's lowered. Uh, that, I mean, in India, perhaps we often uh, link these figures with a lot of jingoism and say that, yes, trade deficit is going lower. Our economy is getting better. But is it really getting better? Is this figure reflective of the real economic situation as far as the trade deficit is concerned? See, if we look at our uh, May trade deficit figure, it is actually not very low. It is dollar ten point five billion. Mm. So it may not be a high, you know, eighteen billion dollar or nineteen billion dollar, but it's also not, you know, four four uh, four billion dollar or five billion dollar. It is at a moderate level, and we have to also try and understand why this figure is at this level. It's because you know the oil prices are low. Mm. Uh, so, if we look at our import bill, we import, you know, around 80% of our uh, our petroleum needs from, uh, like, we import that. Mm. So, uh, because of uh, uh, low oil prices, our import bill has been low, which has really helped us over the last few months. So, in the, I think, January-March figure, our current account deficit uh, has been 0.2%, which is a very comfortable level. But the moment the oil prices go up and mm. international oil prices are not in our control at all. Mm. So, you know, if something happens in the oil producing company, uh, countries, you know, uh, there is some war, there is some tension, then oil prices will zoom again. Mm. And if we look at our import bill, so uh, the, escal the, uh, the decline in imports is mainly due to a, uh, a decline in our oil bill. Mm. So, as soon as the oil import rises, mm then, you know, our import bill, total import bill shoots up. Mm. And if you look at our exports, although, you know, we also uh, export petroleum quite a bit, but our overall exports have been going down. So mm. even if our petroleum exports go up, mm. if the other exports don't go up, then our trade deficit will rise. All right. Uh, and this also impacts, uh, as far as the IIP figures are concerned, mm -hmm. doesn't it? And it's a very direct relation between uh, the export drop and the IIP figures. Yes, because... Uh, IIP, you know, um, the main contributor is manufacturing. Right. So if manufacturing doesn't do well, then of course, you know, our exporters are not doing well because it's a direct relation because, uh, you know, what we, the, our merchandise exports are directly related to our manufacturing, the manufacturing right. that, that happens. And, you know, it's very interesting if we look at our uh, import figures for mm. the past few months, our project goods imports have been declining as well. It is, I think, the second uh, sharpest drop after petroleum imports, so, which shows that there's been a slowdown in manufacturing because project goods, engineering goods, they are they all go into as inputs for manufacturing. So mm. manufacturing drop is a concern for overall production, GDP as well as exports. All right, my final question in this segment then is about the Make in India initiative because uh, the government has been really stressing on this manufacturing, boost manufacturing, get people out of the agrarian economy into manufacturing. But is manufacturing uh, the sector, is it doing well enough for uh, to, to generate that kind of employment and hope uh, in terms of people for that sector saving India and saving the economy? 
you know manufacturing is the mainstay for our economy there is no running away from that and you know the more the government con the focuses on that the better but you know we have to go beyond you know mere sloganeering so when we talk about make in india we have to you know give enough incentives for people you know in the world to come here and invest and make here and also mm -hmm. to our uh, our producers here to right. not go to you know countries that are cheaper say you know bangladesh or sri lanka and produce there mm. so uh, when we talk about make in india the the approach has to be holistic and mm. we have to look at you know all aspects including investments all right in investments is something that we want to talk about in our next segment uh, which is uh, about uh, finance minister arun jaitley traveling to the united states and uh, we'll be talking about that after a very short break so stay tuned for that Welcome back here with Policy Watch. Time now for us to focus on the investment scenario in India. And Finance Minister Arun Jaitley is on a mission. He's in the United States seeking investments into India. And over there, he's expressed confidence that uh, the economic reforms can bring India's gro growth rate to above 7.5% to even 8.1%. Addressing a select audience in the United States, he said he hoped to pass an amendment to implement on time a new goods and services tax that would unify India into a common market. Finance Minister Arun Jaitley assuring investors that the economic reforms in the legislative pipeline can push India's growth rate above the 7 to 7.5 percent range. At a discussion, he said a growth rate of 8.1 to 8.5 percent is totally achievable. Nobody is very excited about a 7, 7.5 percent growth rate in India because a series of reform steps which are in the pipeline have all to be implemented. uh we now have identified all the problem areas and i think one by one as we go resolving most of them hopefully we should reach what our destination targets are jaitley took questions about the ability of the india's government to push through and more importantly implement economic reforms to speed up infrastructure spending and streamline tax policies he acknowledged the bottlenecks in both areas but said that the government was making progress we intend to make a major shift there are direct tax rates for corporate tax which is the main stay come down to 25% so we couldn't afford to live with a much higher taxation regime uh, because that would uh, distract investment coming into india the finance minister said he hoped that the upper house of the parliament would soon pass an enabling amendment that would make it possible to implement on time a new goods and service tax that would unify india into a common market the bill on the gst has been referred to a committee for discussions and jaitley said there is a current majority among the committee in favor of the legislation the government has started putting money substantially into the sector so the sector must start moving uh the resources have come from the budget the resources have come from the reduced cess on uh, the increased cess on petrol and diesel and therefore extra resources this year have been put in jaitley said he was focused on implementing the tax measure by april 1st 2016 the start of the new fiscal year pure report rajasabha tv and we have with us amit e sen senior assistant editor at the hindu business line to help us understand as far as the investment scenarios concerned now we spoke i mean we teased this before we went into that break about the fact that while there are initiatives a lot more needs to be done for streamlining finance minister arun jaitley is in the united states saying that we'll do everything from the policy front to ensure that there's ease of doing business in india but is there enough happening is there enough confidence being generated in an international investor to come and invest in india well you know if you talk to any random foreign investor you know if you ask him or her what is the biggest challenge you think there exists in the indian market they would definitely say policy uncertainty because uh, you know especially after after the retrospective taxation controversy uh, you know the confidence of uh, of international investors in the policy situation in the country has been has shaken quite a bit so i think it is very very important for the finance minister not only to you know talk about uh, you know things like tax terrorism where has happened in the past and mm. all uh, but also you know through definite measures show that the government means business when it says that it wants to bring in stability 
in the policy regime in the country. All right, but in terms of stability, uh, because a, a lot is being said, the government says there'll be single window clearances for projects, there'll be uh, all most major projects will be brought online in terms of ease of doing business, uh, the internet would be used, online would be used, but is there enough happening on the ground? Is there a match between what the government is saying and at the pace that often India moves? There's always a mismatch in that, and do you think this government has been able to bridge that divide? Well, uh, a beginning has actually been made because uh, if you look at uh, what has happened ever since uh, the BJP government has come to power, we do see movement as uh, you know in terms of uh, steps that have been taken to ease uh, ease uh, uh, the ease of doing business. Right. So, uh, like recently, the Director General of Foreign Trade it actually cut down the number of documents that is mandatory documents that is. Uh, you know, that is uh, required to export from 7 to 3, which was a huge step. Mm. And I think the government really takes seriously the World Bank's report on, you know, ease of doing business where India ranks very poorly and it wants India to move up. So, uh, I do expect to see, you know, some activity on in that area because, because they have made a roadmap. Mm. Definitely the roadmap is there. It's just that they have to keep moving in that direction and not lose interest. All right, but, uh, you know, we talked about this in the first segment, about the uh, global economy being sort of still not out completely out of that slowdown that we saw mm -hmm. yeah, happen a few so. years yeah. ago. Yeah. So, uh, in that sense, has India emerged as a viable option? Is India emerging as a viable option? Because, I mean, given the fact that the IMF says India is going to surpass uh, China's growth rate. So, in that sense, uh, do you think India has emerged in terms of the eye of the global investor that this is a destination that perhaps we could put a little bit of money in? See, India has the largest middle class. Mm. So that is what is attracting the foreign investors into the country, irrespective of all the policy flaws that we have. Mm. So that is the biggest strength of the country and that is what, you know, the government is trying to build on. So uh, since we have, you know, the basic requirement that takes to attract investors, we also have a large pool of labor, which is, a, you know, a big plus for manufacturing. So we do have the basic requisites. So I don't, I don't see that there is a, you know, uh, the high growth rate potential that, you know, people are, the, that agencies are, are ascribing to India. They are, you know, way off the mark. I don't see it as like that at all. It's just that, you know, uh, the government has to stay on track. All right. You talked about growth rates and that is quite interesting because we've changed our method of competition of uh, uh, how we, I mean, of GDP. That's right. And uh, in that sense, uh, do you see the global investors also saying that, yeah, fine, they're at 7.5% right now, though it's a completely different method of calculation. And by the previous method of calculation, the growth rate figures would be substantially different, won't they? That is right. You know, growth rates, growth rate numbers are important for attracting investors. But we have to understand that at the end of the day, these are just numbers. You know, so, you know, um, under a different computation method, you may have higher, higher, you know, growth figure. But if it does not translate into, you know, a, a better, a better decisions at the policy level, you know, easier, you know, uh, ease of doing business and things that will really help people to manufacture in the country, to export from the country. I don't think, you know, just a, a little change in computation method which which increases uh, growth figures would make that kind of a difference. All right, but what would then make a difference? You mentioned about uh, the clearances, that ease of doing business. But, uh, I mean, uh, the fact is that there are a lot of initiatives. As we've spoken about Make in India, the fact that the government is trying to boost manufacturing. They're opening up uh, investment into various sectors that were traditionally closed. But there are a lot of issues, and India being the country that it is, uh, given the fact that economic decisions also often become very political ones. So, uh, in terms of uh, how the government is able to push through its agenda, do you think there is that kind kind of a reform agenda and uh, is the government being able to push through that because uh, for example retail if you talk about retail uh, FDI in that I mean it's still not very clear as to what the government's own stand is. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier you know policy stability and clarity of policy is really important to you know send the right signals to global investors uh, like retail you mentioned retail it's a very interesting example you know on one hand uh, you know, you know government feels politically compelled to say that it will not allow FDI in retail at least you know, uh, in the current scenario, but at the same time, it has not done away with the older policy, which allows 51% FDI in retail. Mm. So basically, you know, these are confusing signals because you're you're trying to, you know, just signal to the global community that you know we may open the sector sometime because the policy is still there. But you know, when journalists ask you questions, you say no, 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 no. You know, we have to protect our uh, our own small retailers, and so we won't open. So. Uh, 
so that that is so those are the things that i think the government should avoid hmm. so if you have decided to do something you just go out and tell the world in clear words that we have decided it so you know on one hand uh, we have a positive decision in the area of insurance hmm. which has uh, which has uh, you know lifted the image of the country a bit but on the other hand there is an area like retail and also you know uh, also the land acquisition policy yeah i was you just know. about to come to that because uh, to drive in investments into the country you're asking companies to come and set up big businesses big factories in india i mean from the times of the scz policy to now where we've come in terms of land acquisition that still remains a cause for concern that still remains one of the big sticking points as far as development of infrastructure across the country is concerned that's right you know uh, the problem with the land acquisition policy is that uh, i think i think the government was Uh, it became just too ambitious it wanted a lot of things at one go mm. which you can't do because you know when you're talking about land acquisition you also have to think about you know people from whom you're taking the land so as on one hand you have a good package but at at the you know on the other uh, you make acquisition you know at the will of the government completely mm. at the will of the government so even if you know all the people in a parcel of land are saying that please don't take our land so that will not count for anything so that kind of things Are are not politically. You cannot sell such a thing politically. So because of you know this over ambition, hmm. the whole land acquisition bill has come to a standstill. Absolutely. And as long as we don't have clarity on land acquisition, then you know investors are not comfortable at all. So uh, there is a there is a fast. You know you talked about US some hmm. time back. So uh, there is a fa fast track on uh, for uh, US investors that the government has set up. And the biggest you know problem that many US investors in the country. have been talking about is land acquisition hmm. so we have to realize that it's a big issue and you have to tackle it by you know um, taking a middle path hmm. all right but as far as finance minister arun jaitley is concerned i mean what he's been saying in the us just deriving my question from there he's talked about the goods and services tax as the most critical reform and uh, it certainly seems uh, ambitious but uh, there is enough uh, traction in, among state governments that the government has been able to generate do you think uh, this goods and services tax could very soon become a reality and in that sense ease of doing business would uh, become better in india more investments would come in is that that critical factor that could really change things around uh, it could if you know gst the ultimate gst you know the shape that it will finally take would be close to what you know the gst initially aimed at you mm. know to have a uniform tax across states so uh, if you look at the problems that still exist that you know still have to be basically sorted out with some states it one of the issues is you know that the states want to impose some kind of a tax of their own so if that kind of a tax is imposed then you know the the very the very uh, you know objective behind the gst is lost so and the gst thing has been dragging for so long mm. that you know i think till it happens people are not going to believe that it's happening so All right, but uh, you know the, the finance minister. I remember from his budget speech. I mean, he talked about the fact that everybody expects a big bang reform, and if you have a big bang idea, come to me. That's what he said. They come to me and tell me, and I'll implement it. He's talking about incremental reforms. On one hand, there are incremental reform happening. Uh, I mean, in the sense that, uh, fine, the land acquisition bill or the GST bill might be landmark reforms, but they're still not a reality. So, incremental change is enough. Incremental change happening in the economy to boost investor sentiment, or is it not? and uh, the, as far as the big bang reforms are concerned do you think the government should uh, do more perhaps divestment is a good route to generate more money as well well that depends on what kind of things you're divesting hmm. so if you're if you're just divesting the you know the the cash rich uh, the cash rich uh, ps uh, ps use then i don't know because there is the other side of argument as well which says that you know the the ps use that are working well why not you know use them to generate more resources hmm. to generate more jobs so uh, i don't know whether you know selling off psus of you know selling off your your assets to generate more wealth for the country whether that is that because you know ultimately you are going to run out of it so right. to have to have you know as a long term you know growth plank i don't think that is a very sustainable one all right but in terms of then big ticket reforms what are we looking at we're looking at the gst we're looking at the land acquisition bill but uh, is that enough my question simply remains that is that enough to boost investor sentiment is the indian economy is health good enough to say that fine people who'd been investing in elsewhere around the world the fii's come to india and say that fine india is now stable india is good let's put our money in over here well see land is a very important aspect as we've already discussed so if we have a, a proper land acquisition bill in place i think that is going to take care of a big portion of the of the problem that international investors have in the country and 
as the as the fm has said in in the us that you know uh, all the all the concerns that investors have related to taxation policies in the country mm. that the country is that you know the finance ministry is very actively looking at so if they can you know take care of uh, of the concerns of the genuine concerns that the investors have not that you know we have to just go totally by what investors want because mm. there is no end to what yeah, they yeah. want so but you know the genuine concerns if they are taken care of i think i think taxation concerns land that will take care of you know more than half of uh, the problems that investors have All right. So let's hope that uh, the finance minister Arun Jaitley, in his trip to the United States, can drum up a lot of investments. Uh, Amit Singh, thank you very much for coming in and helping us understand uh, these figures of trade deficit and also as far as the investment climate in India is concerned. That a little better. Thanks so much for that. On that note, uh, we'll wrap up policy watch for now. But we'll be back next week with another edition. So do stay tuned to Rajya Sabha TV.